Well, okay. This uh, this sutta, the Yamakavaga Sutta, um, is the first sutta in the Dhammapada. Uh, the Dhammapada is a 26 chapter volume in the Kudaka Nikaya, uh, which has five separate books um, that are otherwise difficult to classify. That's why they're in that that uh, part of the Pali Canon. Uh, and this one relates directly to uh, the Mula Sutta and in a general way to the idea of becoming. In the Mula Sutta, the Buddha points out and develops the understanding that our relationship with ordinary phenomena arising and passing away is governed by the level of mindfulness. In fact, the line is, the mind is the governing principle. And this, there's a line here that, that says exactly the same thing. Um, I gave enough of an introduction. What is interesting to me about this sutta is that you could say in a rather general way that everything the Buddha teaches is so that we can gain control of our minds, gain control of the way that we think. I just wonder if I had my glasses on top of my head. Um, and like he says in the Bhattaka Santana Sutta that I, I mention often, through the Dhamma, we gain the ability to think what we want to think when we want to think it. When Once we have control of our mind and our thoughts are framed by right mindfulness, meaning framed by the Eightfold Path, then that will determine our experience. And if our thoughts are continually or continued to be rooted in ignorance, that will define and describe our, our life experience. The life experience itself is completely um, ordinary and the same. In other words, nothing's really different. It's, it's simply the way that we're seeing things or reviewing things. We've gone from a wrong view to a right view. And give me a second, I'll swallow. Excuse me, Lorna. The Buddha says in this short sutta, it's actually not a sutta, it's a section from the Dhammapada. The quality of mind precedes all mental states. So it simply means that whatever quality of mind, whatever we're holding in mind is going to determine the experience that we have. Mind is the governing principle. Mind defines all phenomena. If a person speaks or acts with an impure mind, suffering will follow like a wheel following an oxen's hoof. So again, the importance of what we're holding in mind and what we're using to base our perceptions on. And now you remember how the uh, dependent origination, how it, it teaches us from a mind rooted in the ignorance of Four Noble Truths comes fabrications. And those fabrications then form the view of what we're experiencing. Those, then those fabrications are what we're holding in mind. We're literally holding in mind corrupted views of what's occurring. We can't see things clearly. We're in wrong view. The quality of mind precedes, Buddha continues, the quality of mind precedes all mental states. Mind is the governing principle. Mind defines all phenomena. If a person speaks or acts with a pure mind, happiness will follow like a constant shadow. So those two lines give us the choice that we have in each and every moment. We can have a mind that's rooted in ignorance and suffer the consequences of that, or we can gain control of our thinking through the Eightfold Path, and happiness will follow like a constant shadow. Harboring thoughts of being abused, robbed, injured, or overpowered does not still hatred. Those who harbor such thoughts will remain agitated. Notice here, and I was kind of struck by this because there's, it seems like we're getting ever more um, blameful, I can use that word, in our society. We're always looking to who, who, who or what we can pin our disappointment on and who caused this. Notice that the Buddha is not saying that whatever happened to us didn't happen, but our reaction to it is what will determine whether we'll remain at peace or whether, whether we'll continue the reaction the initial reaction that is rooted in the mind lacking concentration and right view. And he continues that theme, that, that theme with this thought. 
with this statement, abandoning thoughts of being abused, robbed, injured, or overpowered always stills hatred. So he's not saying that, that hurtful things won't happen to us, but it's up to us whether we're going to harbor those thoughts of ill will, continue to blame others, and maybe even blame ourselves in some way. Uh, we often do that, don't we? That um, something happens that's just a, really an ordinary occurrence of life. And we blame ourselves because we weren't living up to our own expectations or our expectations of others. This underlying um, notion of self-loathing that's almost always there to a mind rooted in ignorance. And the Buddha simply, he's not saying that it doesn't happen or it shouldn't happen or it's bad when it happens. He simply says when it happens, abandon the thoughts of ill will that we're holding towards ourselves and others. The Buddha continues, hatred always continues hatred. And that's a strong word, but we could simply use the word aversion will always continue aversion. Whatever we're averse to is going to persist. Um, I used to use this little saying once in a while that what what we resist will persist, and it certainly is true. What we're what we're holding up against is really what we're going to be most mindful of. But we can abandon those thoughts. It takes a mind that is well concentrated through shamatha vipassana meditation. So it looks like somebody joined us, uh, and the the thoughts need to be framed by the entire eightfold path. But when they are, we can abandon those thoughts of hatred and aversion. Non-hatred alone ends hatred. Non-aversion alone will end aversion. The Buddha says this law is timeless. I mean, he's just making the point that this is a simple, basic fact of human existence, that if we want to end hatred and aversion in our minds, we simply abandon it. We don't look for justification for how we felt what caused it, where we're going with it, we simply recognize that it's present and abandon it. Many ignore the fleeting nature of life. The wise who understand impermanence do not quarrel with others. It's just simply another way to talk about the cow getting, uh, gaining on us all the time. We don't know when the end's gonna come. Do we wanna spend our last moments fighting with ourselves and others? The wise know the nature of impermanence. They understand impermanence and we do not quarrel with others. Just as a strong wind will fall a weak tree, ignorance will consume those living for sensual pleasures, lacking restraint, gorging on food, lazy. Just as a strong wind does not affect a rocky mountain, ignorance will never cling to those who are mindful of the defilements, wise in restraint, moderate with food, with conviction for the Dhamma, and tireless in their efforts. That, again, that one sex, that one paragraph there, clearly defines a person who, I think you, you remember how Anthony uh, brought up last Saturday, I think, that sometimes he uses the visual of sitting like a mountain. Well, there's, and this is what I was referring to when I said, yeah, the Buddha says that sometimes. Sitting like a mountain, like a rocky mountain, unwavering, control of our thoughts. It doesn't matter what, ha what happens. We haven't lost our, mo our mind and we don't lose our mind over, over sensory input, over, over food, over uh, the need for constant um, social stimulation. We have conviction for the Dhamma and we'll remain tireless in our efforts. Those ignorant, depraved, lacking restraint, dishonest, though wearing a disciple's robe, are not worthy of respect. The Buddha's talking about um, those that simply, whether you're actually putting on a robe or not, that those, that those that put on the robe of Buddhism call themselves Buddhists, but are practicing something entirely different than what the Buddha taught. That they continue their arrogance, they continue their ill will towards others. And they are, they are not worthy of, of respect that would be given to a wise person, someone who is actually developing the Buddha's Dhamma, someone who's actually developing the Eightfold Path. He's certainly not teaching that we should be disrespectful, but respectful in this sense, in that we recognize the value of another person's Dhamma practice, and we respect that. And we also recognize those that, that no matter what robe they're wearing, if they're teaching false Dhammas and continuing to 
uh, direct people towards further ignorance, excuse me. Contributing to others' ignorance, whether directly by um, false Dhamma teachings or indirectly by tacit support in something that uh, does not deserve to be called Buddhist practice. This is what he's talking about here. Saturday's talk, by the way, Lauren, will have a, a little bit to do with this if you haven't read it already. Those who have abandoned ignorance and depravity in control of their senses, established in virtue, they alone are worthy of respect. They are Dhamma practitioners. Those that crave for and cling to what is worthless and ignore what is priceless. Now the Buddha is talking about a Dhamma practice or, or a, a practice that might be thought of as a Dhamma practice, but is in fact worthless because it's focused on something that the mind should not be holding in mind. Mindful of what is rooted in ignorance, these will never realize the Dhamma. Those that know the heart would, and the Buddha's talking of heartwood, he's always referring to the Eightfold Path. Those that know the heartwood to be heartwood and sapwood to be sapwood, establish and refine, and refine mindfulness, they will realize the Dhamma. Just as rain will rot a poorly roofed house, passion will rot a poorly developed mind. And that, and that includes the, the passion for, for continual um, practices that will only continue self-identification with fabricated views. Just as rain will, will not rot a properly roofed house, passion will never destroy a properly developed mind. We have control of our minds. The ignorant, hurtful in thoughts, words, and deeds, suffers endlessly. Afflicted with regret, always mindful of misdeeds. In other words, even um, we can't escape the results of our own thoughts, hurtful thoughts, and hurtful actions. No matter how hard we try, there are always going to be an underlying factor of our thinking. Let's read that last line. Afflicted with regret, always mindful of misdeeds. When the Buddha describes the nature of suffering, one of the words that he uses is sorrow, regret, etc., etc. We we are we become stuck in regret when we hurt others, whether it's inadvertently but out of ignorance, and hurt ourselves. Another the the word for regret towards ourselves is remorse, and this is something that is a constant underlying factor of a mind rooted in ignorance. The wise, pure in thought, word, and deed, rejoice endlessly. They are at peace, always mindful of the benefits of restraint. The ignorant, hurtful in thoughts, words, and deeds, they suffer endlessly. Mindful of misdeeds, they are constantly tormented. The wise, pure in thought, word, and deed, are always delighted. Mindful of their purity means we know that when our minds are pure. It's not something that um, we have to grasp after. All we have to do is develop the Dhamma as the Buddha teaches it. And we will know that our minds are rested in purity. We don't need a social gathering. Um, uh, receiving the approval of others to tell us that our minds are pure. That doesn't work either. The Dhamma in some respects is meant to be developed individually and um, in seclusion. And then out of that seclusion, meaning our meditation practice, we are able to take that within a, to a well-focused Sangha. Read that again. The wise, pure in thought, word, and deed are always delighted. Mindful of their purity, they are constantly delighted. Much though they read sacred texts, but acting poorly, overcome by greed, they do not gain the benefits of the heart, heartwood. And of course, if you were developing the heartwood, you wouldn't be acting poorly. You'd be guided by the Eightfold Path. Little though they read sec sacred texts, but putting the Dhamma into practice, abandoning greed, aversion, and deluded thinking with true wisdom, their mind free from ignorance, clinging to nothing in this world or any other, this one has gained the benefits of the well-integrated life. Obviously, just the Buddha putting great emphasis on developing the heartwood of the Dhamma, the Eightfold Path, uh, 
developing a well-concentrated mind, a mind that has ever deepening levels of jhana that supports this refined mindfulness to see things in a way that allow freedom from reaction, that there is always um, a profound level of restraint within that level of mindfulness. Um, that's the end. I thought that was the end of the sutta. That's the end of the sutta. There's such a, uh, you can turn your mic on one if you want. There's such a, um, a powerful message here, um, but pointing directly to the importance of gaining control of our thinking. And that's resting in a, a, a meditation practice that is solely focused on gaining concentration. That's the essence of a, uh, of a ref of refined mindfulness rests in that concentration. A mind that is not concentrated is a mind that is always out of control. No matter how much we can meditate for, you know, for millions of years, if the practice itself doesn't conduce towards jhana, towards ever deepening levels of meditation, we're just reinforcing a mind that is constantly distracted. And it did be, I, I know I asked you twice. I want to make that one this one point. A lot of meditation today is taught, called mindfulness meditation is this, this um, all encompassing theme, mindfulness, uh, that what we should do is to be mindful of the contents of our mind. And that's just furthering distraction. It just, it, it, it emphasizes that which is distracting us, our own thoughts. And so when we take a, a so-called meditation practice and use it to be mindful of what's occurring in our thinking process, we're just continuing down that rat hole. The Buddha taught to recognize in the Satipatthana Sutta, many people misunderstand that, to be mindful of thoughts arising and passing away and feelings arising and passing away, always coming back to the sensation of breathing, not using it for analysis or embracing our thoughts or anything like that. Deepening concentration is simple and direct practice. And that, gain, that allows us to gain control of our thinking. So here's my talk for tonight, Lorna. What do you think? <laughs> um, as always, it's, it's very good, very thoughtful, um, very insightful. Um, and I know the um, what you're referring to when you're meditating, come back to you, it doesn't matter how many times you go on a, on a train of thought, you know, to, to, to recognize that you're on a train of thought and just come back to your breath, that's it. That's it. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Um, when you do knit some of that time together, when you are not, when your mind is just focusing on your breathing and you're not on a train of thought, um, it, it really is quite wonderful. Um, it's, well, it's just a wonderful place for your mind to be. The thing is, sometimes I get lazy. You know, sometimes it's easy to use your meditation time to sit and think about something because you, you, there's nothing else going on, but you've just to be strict with yourself and do the, do the practice, do the work. You've just got to recognize that you're on the cushion to come back to your breath when you're on a train of thought and that's it. Yeah. Um, out of the uh, passages you've just read, I think probably the third and the fourth one down, harboring thoughts of being abused, robbed, injured, or overpowered does not still hatred. Um, when I first, I read this um, prior to your class tonight, and when I read that, my mind immediately went to my dyslexia. Um, and I still do consider myself as being injured or not a complete person, et cetera, et cetera, through, through my dyslexia. And when I read that passage, um, you know, that's what my mind jumped to. And I can assure you that it's perfectly true because when I'm trying to cover up my dyslexia, et cetera, I have anything but a still mind. It's, I bring, I bring the second and the third and the fourth arrow onto myself, you know, just just by my own thoughts. Um, so that so that little passage meant a lot to me. 
Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's also a, a, a common theme. I mean, most, most of us don't, get, don't escape our life without having some type of trauma. Yours was particularly severe and long lasting. Um, but unless we have a way of understanding what we're doing to ourselves because of it, mm. there's no way of, of working through that, is it? I mean, it's, it's very practical therapy in that way. Yes, it is. And, and I understand that's the way to go. Um, but when you're in a social situation with people that you don't know, the last thing that you want them to know is that you can't spell or you can't read very well or something like that. It's, it just still has that um, cloud over me, uh, which I need to sort of look. At. That's probably one of the reasons why I thought I'd come to your classes, you know, just to realize what you know, realize the second and the third and the fourth arrow can do and, and there is a way to abandon your own thoughts and just accept that it's not an injury or or anything, you know, it, it's not like that. It's just, it's just my brain's different to most other people. That's it. Um, yeah. And it, it's not an injury in that sense, but it's just not very helpful in life sometimes. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, I mean, I have come to realize a lot of, I'm bringing a lot of it on myself. And to be honest, in society, I think today people are getting more and more accepting of our differences, um, you know, yeah, in many, so. many ways, and I think people are more accepting of it. And I, I, but I'm still locked in being ashamed of it. It's a funny situation. That's the that's the condition aspect of it, you know, because of what's happened, because of um, reasonable reaction. It's not like you did something wrong. Anybody would react in the way that you did, and now you have found a path of undoing that conditioning. That's again, that's why the path is there. Yeah. It's different for, it, for, for de other people, but we're all conditioned in that same manner from, from reacting to what's occurring in our environment and our view of ourself. Uh, in, in fact, the wrong view of yourself, but, but you, you, uh, let me just hold on one second. There's Jane. Hello, Jane. I'm sorry. Jane, are you there? Uh, Lauren, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Was, it looked, Jane was having trouble getting in. I hope she's here. Um, if you can, uh, maybe I got to do this. Well, Jane, if you can say hello, say hello. Um, you know, what I was saying to, to Lorna, unless we have a way of recognizing there's another way of thinking about ourselves in relation to the world, in relation to our trauma, there's, it's completely unreasonable to think that we could change the way that we think. How would you? And so the, the Buddha realized that too. He didn't, when he, he said that suffering occurs as a, as a re direct result of ignorance of the way things are, it's specifically this situation that he was talking about, not just the underlying disappointment of having a human life, but the specific disappointment of, of individual uh, emotional trauma. Because this is what happens. We can, our minds become conditioned towards thinking about ourselves in a certain way. We feel like um, we're inadequate. We might feel that the world is constantly against us or whatever conclusions we come to, but they're all rooted in conditioned thinking. In other words, or what I'm saying, what the, the feeling that you carried around with you most of your life, Lorna, was something that occurred many, many years ago, and yet was still present because you were holding it in mind. You were mindful of it. The, the, the Buddha was teaching or taught and in this sutta directly that we can change the way we think. We can change what we're holding in mind. And when we let go of things such as past trauma, even though it takes a process for most of us, we free our minds and our minds are, as the Buddha describes here, we are then resting in delight. Even though you're the same person, you might even have the same thoughts, but you're no longer reacting to it because you're not conditioned to them. 
Makes sense, doesn't it? It certainly does, John. It certainly does. And I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, it's just out there. I have to work on it, you know. Yeah, well, uh, you have. You've made tremendous that, strides. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Lana. Well, you know, just that that's that's probably the deepest um, problem that I have really deep down inside me. That's probably the deepest problem that I have, really. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there are many other things in the suitor tonight um, that are just fact, factual, factual insights, uh, just for you to hold in mind. Um, Obviously, you know, from, from words of the Buddha are always worth dwelling on and, and thinking about. And so it, it's, yeah. it's a very good suitor. And I appreciate that uh, what trouble you've done, put into your classes. Well, no trouble. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying it, uh, saying that. Uh, it looks like Jane uh, left. I wonder if she was having difficulty, but I'll, I'll ask her. Um, well, okay, Lorna, thank you for joining tonight. I'll see you uh, Saturday. Yes, you will. Did you get a chance to read the Kavada Sutta? No, that's the Saturday Sutta. Uh, no, I haven't yes. had a look at it yet. No, but okay. I will. Yeah, it's kind of a long one, but I think I'm going to try and do it in one, one class because I want to get to the truth of happiness in two weeks. Good. All right, thank you for joining. Please say hello to Tom. I will, John. Thank Please you. Pass. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.